So we'll talk about operating uh, Flink on Mesos at scale. Uh, so just a quick poll, how many of you know Mesos? How many of you know Branch? Okay, how many of you know Flink? Just to check. Okay, uh, great. I hope uh, on the first and second agenda item, we'll change the number of hands going up in this talk. And uh, so we, um, that's, so I'm a, the technical lead for community projects at Mesosphere. That means I'm working together, for example, with the Flink team on integrating Flink well with Mesos. And actually, I must say I like the Flink team quite a lot because originally I'm also from Germany, so I've worked with a lot of those guys for a long time. Some of those people actually sat next to me while I was doing a PhD in the same office, so I really enjoy being here. Thank you so much for organizing this. And next to me is... Nice to meet you guys. So my name is Vishwajit Das. I manage the data platform and infrastructure at Branch. Three of my co-workers have also joined me. If you guys have any questions after the talk, we will be more than happy to answer that also. All right, so just to clear up what Apache Mesos is, we'll have that in some more detail uh, in the following uh, slides in the presentation. But at its core, it's a resource manager. So imagine I ha I'm having a large cluster and I kind of need to negotiate resources between different systems running on top. So that might be Flink, that might be multiple instances of Flink, that might be Flink plus Spark, plus Cassandra, plus Kafka, plus Kubernetes. So whenever I have multiple distributed frameworks, distributed systems, we want to share the same resources on the cluster, this is kind of where Mesos comes in. So it's fault tolerant, battle tested, so it's been used by Twitter for over 10 years to drive Twitter. Uh, it's scalable to in some of those clusters to more than 10,000 nodes. Most of you have probably used a Mesos cluster in the background, may it be for Twitter, uh, may it be for Airbnb. So this is something really nice working on Mesos that you know you actually have an impact on those large clusters. Why should we combine Flink and Mesos? So uh, Mesos is kind of offering exactly this functionality we were talking about that it gives me access to like a shared large infrastructure and also it makes it very easy to implement a so-called scheduler. Uh, we'll see that in a second. To actually run Flink in an elastic and scalable way on top of this yeah, shared infrastructure. And so actually in 2016 when I was talking to Till, kind of one of the driving factors was also that already 30% uh, of a survey respondents uh, from the Flink community were actually already running Flink on top of Mesos despite there not being any official support. So that's when we started adding uh, official support. Um, as you might know, oh, and just a short uh, call out already, Aaron, he was here back row there, he actually implemented this first version uh, of Flink uh, on Mesos and is still a very active contributor, so thank you very much for driving that. And he didn't want to send me a picture up front. Uh, other, so there are actually other deployment models in, uh, for Flink and it always depends on your use case, what's best for you. So standalone, uh, like the old traditional one, uh, the other one is Yarn. and. Uh, as of today, you can also run it on top of Kubernetes in a slightly different way. Uh, we'll see, so there's no uh, resource manager, but we'll see that uh, throughout the next slides, what that means. So with Flink, you actually have options and you should choose the right deployment model for your use case. Why Mesos? So uh, what we typically see is uh, clusters where you don't only want to run a single workload. You might want to run two kind of sub-Flink clusters, one is the production, the other is the test. Then you on top have Kafka maybe to drive uh, the messages into Flink. You might even have Kubernetes, you might have HDFS as a distributed file system layer. So you actually run a lot of those distributed frameworks on top of one infrastructure. Um, what we saw earlier is that people actually went in, they took the first five nodes for the first Flink cluster, they took the next eight nodes for the next Flink cluster, so they kind of statically partitioned their cluster into many subclusters, one for each of those systems. 
And first of all, this is from an operations perspective, this becomes really difficult. And secondly, it's also uh, quite a waste of resources because each of those subclusters you're provisioning for the maximum workload. So in each of those subclusters, you're kind of wasting resources. And so the idea of Mesos, and therefore also for DCOS, which is kind of a distribution built around uh, by Mesosphere, is to actually view this, your data center, all your nodes, as one common pool of resources. So it's similar as with this laptop. This laptop has multiple CPUs, but when I'm showing this presentation right now, I don't care which of these CPUs is being used. I simply want that the presentation is running on one of those CPUs. So Mesos is doing something similar for the data center. You don't necessarily care on which node it is running, of course, you can have uh, certain constraints. Uh, you don't want to place them together on one node or similar stuff. But in general, you only care that it's running somewhere in your data center. And as opposed to my laptop, where I hope that all the CPUs will survive this day, in a data center, we also have the issue that there actually might be node failures or network failures, so that certain resources might become unavailable. So Mesos is then also responsible for detecting that and actually uh, referring this information back to the Flink scheduler, which can then react to that. So kind of keep it up and running. Because if I'm an operator, uh, and I have to take care of all those tasks, deploying, scaling, configuring, uh, recovery if something goes wrong at 3 a.m. in the morning, and I have to take care of all those frameworks, this is a pretty hard job. So I would actually prefer, just because there's a node failure in my cluster, I don't want to be woken up at 3 a.m. at night. I want the system to take care of that by itself. And this is where the Mesos architecture comes in. So the, one of the core ideas of Mesos is the so-called two-level scheduling. And let's just see what that means. So if we look at a distributed system running on a cluster, there are two kinds of decisions. The first decision is which resources should belong to which system. So I'm having here a number of uh, agents. So those agents, they are the nodes providing resources. And now either an operator goes in and statically assigns them to a particular framework, or I actually have Mesos taking care of this. So the first level of scheduling is actually the resource scheduling, which is being taken care of by Mesos. So Mesos goes in and decides uh, which resources should go to the Flink scheduler, which resources should go to the Spark scheduler, which resources should go to the uh, Kafka scheduler. And then the second iteration of scheduling is the task scheduling. So the question, which task do I want to place where, and how do I want to deal with failures? So if one of my tasks fails, how do I need to react? And so we notice this is actually quite different for different frameworks. It's very different from Flink, uh, when we, for example, compare it to HDFS, what do I do in case of HDFS? I first, I have a pretty complex deployment order, so I first have to deploy uh, uh, the journal nodes, uh, name nodes, and then I can deploy the data nodes. And uh, with Flink, this doesn't matter so much, so we have more flexibility. So, but basically, the scheduler is taking care of this deployment order, and secondly, it's also taking care of if something fails. So if both, in the HDFS case again, if both my name nodes are down, how can I react to that? I actually need to recover from the uh, journal nodes. And previously, this had meant uh, someone had to wake up. Uh, in this case, actually, the scheduler, the operator, can take care of this. Um, so what, what this actually drives is a quite vast ecosystem of different systems running on top. So this is the catalog we have in this DCOS, and this allows me to install all those tools as kind of distributed systems. And this is actually just the upper section, so there are over 100 tools, and those are the certified ones which are tested well on all different kinds of cluster iterations. But just installing an HDFS cluster, Flink cluster, plus Kafka cluster next to it with a single click is something pretty nice uh, to drive. This is kind of this DCOS. One marketing slide, sorry for that. Uh, so uh, the idea of DCOS is kind of to uh, build a distribution around Mesos, which gives you flexibility to both run all those different services on top and actually also to 
be deployed on any kind of infrastructure. So you're not restricted to any particular cloud environment. You can easily go across boundaries from on-prem to cloud. Right. And now the actual interesting stuff. Uh, how does Flink and Mesos work together? So this is the old slash, I would call it simplified picture. I still wanted to start with that to kind of give you an idea. What is the idea for the job and resource manager? So if this is running in a cluster, uh, we have here the uh, resource and job manager. And they're actually talking to this Mesos master. And as mentioned earlier, this Mesos master will kind of forward resources. So it will tell uh, or it will ask Flink, uh, hey, Flink, I have five CPUs. I have 10 gigabytes of RAM. What can you do with that? And then it's actually the, uh, the decision here to start a new task with that or not. And so those tasks, they can run all over the cluster, and the job manager is, is owning those and spinning up a cluster for this Flink job dynamically. Um, previously, uh, you, it basically meant you would start one of those instances here, so uh, resource manager, job manager, kind of per job. Um, and what we have now uh, as the next step uh, with a over the last two releases, basically, it came step by step in. Uh, we actually, we have a dispatcher. And this dispatcher is kind of a long running thing. So uh, we typically run it with the init system of such kind of cluster, which is Marathon. Marathon is called Marathon because it, it's there to keep a task running for forever. So if this Flink dispatcher fails, Marathon would notice and actually restart that. And so this is kind of the the endpoint where I can start a new job. And when I start a new job, uh, the dispatcher gets uh, new resources for starting this uh, Flink master process here. And then once the master process has started, it can actually uh, allocate and start all its tasks. And this gives us a lot more flexibility uh, as there's one of those master processes really owning that job and being dynamically started for that. All right, and so having given this introduction of how Flink and Mesos work together, uh, I would actually hand over to you, and you can give like a practical example of how that's running. Thank you, Joe. Mm -hmm. I've hardly seen any hand about the branch, so I'll just mm -hmm. first talk, like take a minute to talk about it. The branch is an ad tech company, so it provides a platform mm, for the user engagement and measurement of the cross-channel, cross demand. Cross that's our mission. Now the context of the this talk, like one of the use case we used to have, like a lot of time. If you see our uh, sub-second latency analytics, mostly on the dashboard side, like the most the marketer or the campaigner, they run the campaign in somewhere, you know, some channel, like a, either it's Facebook or Google or some other different channel, and they come and see those stats in the dashboard. So that's where the use case come from: sub-second latency. Uh, the real-time dashboard, those are all the stats. And one of the other use cases, we do like a live queries for the uniques because we count those impressions. Those are also like a for sub-second latency. And another use case, we do more of a, like an exploratory analytics. A lot of time, our internal like a data science and go, they kind of slice and dice the data like as it's coming on the way. So going back to the history, actually, originally we used to, this is our, sorry, that's a slow. <laughs> That's fine. That's okay. Ah. So this well, so most of us, well, most of our like we use the Kafka as a message bus. So originally we used to have a Lambda system based on Spark streaming. We used to do from Kafka to Spark streaming, and we used to use RPC system for Finagle, and then we'd send, we used to send it to Druid. And similarly, we used to have a batch system which we used to collect all the events like for last two three hours, and then run a Spark job, clean it up create on S3 and then parquet and then replace whatever the streaming pipeline. Over the, this is our original Lambda system. We ran it for years. And last year onwards, we started seeing some of the problem during the surge window. Actually, when we, we this system was built originally, we were like around 24,000 to 30,000 RPS. And the last year, sometime, I, I'll say 2017, like a June, July onwards, is like volume started increasing. Before that, we anticipating, we started evaluating like what are the different options. 
So we came out, of, we decided to go a couple of, out of the couple of options we choose, we decided to go with the Flink. We know that we had to do some work because one of the things we have, if you see in one of the down here, so even though in the Lambda system, the real time, but if the real time there is any drop, so what do we have to do? We have to wait like a two, three hours to in this batch, like to accumulate so that a batch can clean all the data in a parquet and then we can ingest. So if there is an incident happens on the real time path, we are not able to backfill the data immediately. So we are looking for a system that time which can be as a like a real streaming, even the warehouse side also. I did send a couple of mails into the Flink group, like how can we do, there's no good parquet writer in that time at the Flink. Last year in the Flink conference, I got some hints from some of the Netflix guys I talked, they said they are doing something in the similar line. So then what we decided to buy ourselves, one of the guy here is how he's the guy. So we decided to fork the Flink. I'll come again. So we use same like streaming path. We still go like directly it goes. We don't, we use a, this is a stateless streaming path we took because one of the problems that's why I was talking with Stefan today also, Flink is still cannot do stateful scaling. If you have a stateful state save, you cannot like scale it like high without like a downtime. So this is our streaming path, we changed it to, and in the batch path, what we decided, as I said, the previous one, we had like a three hours to accumulate. We decided to create a streaming warehouse directly from via Flink. And so what we did, we forked the Parquet open source, we created a stream writer. And we use, a, we use a both checkpoint and save point, but for this we use save point. For more details, you can talk how he is more aware of that he has built that part. So in the what do we do, we save that, this, because this is our like a source of truth now. And uh, we from the, if it's a crash or downtime, we retrieve from the save point. We keep the save point in HDFS. And that's how we achieve that exactly once in the warehouse. Now with this warehouse, what do you do? Like it's literally like a 10 minutes behind. So even there is an incident happens at the streaming path, we found some, we actually, though there could be partial here, like it's not full, but from the end user's point of view, it's not blank. We literally can backfill immediately after the incident. So that's one of the great wins for us. And then also like previously, like a lot of the data science job, those guys used to run like a two, three hours behind because the accumulation used to time. They are literally can now, we use Presto for our internal query. So they can now live query this warehouse data, but it's pretty much 10 minutes behind. And all other downstream job also, bad jobs runs from this same system. It's like pretty much you can run like a one hour behind. One of the problem we still saw is, this is we're talking with today with a lot of people here, so as I said, it's stateful, you cannot scale high because it's a stateful, there's a downtime, right? So a lot of time we found a problem, we run on Mesos, we, we do, I'll talk about it in the next slide. If we take a delay, because some of our, the, the RPS is 100,000 per second. So if like there are a couple of minutes or 10 minutes delay, generally the fling guys take some time to come up, right? That creates a back pressure. Or if there is some disaster, say we had a, like a five, six hours, like a loss of data. If we have to recover the old path, still we keep the archive. This is the open source project from Pinterest we use. And we have the same mechanism, like we built a tool from here, we publish it back to Flink, and then we populate, and we move the actual the streaming pipeline from the head. So it keeps moving, and we recover from it here. This is now in our production, and it's running really good. We have like from the Spark wall to we see like a lot of wins here. There are some of the work still needs to be done, the team is working. The deployment wise, like we run our, this whole Flink infrastructure, we have around 40 jobs, streaming jobs. We run everything on Mesos. Uh, we use Apache Mesos mm, for that. And all our deployments are done through by CI CD. So we have a template based mechanism, like based on the job, we define like a template, okay, the, how much parallelism, how much resources required. So this is our deployment workflow. Like if you merge to the Git, we run our Circle CI, and the Circle CI will create a container with our private repo, and then we have a template here, basically, and that template will then deploy to Mesos. Uh, during the early days, I talked to Aaron. Uh, so the um, Flink, like generally, like if you see, if you are guys familiar with running Kubernetes, um, Spark on Kubernetes, basically, 
One of the problem used to fake when the, sometime in the bigger cluster, if you have a multi-talent share cluster, getting the resource, it takes time. Like, uh, you know, if you have a 50, 60 job running on that time. So how do you know in the CI CD environment, how do you know when all the resources come came and that you can submit your job? So that's why Flip6, I think, solves some of the problem, those. So what we did, we built in our own scheduler, custom scheduler inside. It's kind of like a fork JBM inside the container we run. So if you see, that's a custom, this is like a mesos that's on the container. We run a custom scheduler. What it does actually, it, it, it has a ENB inside, and it knows that for G, this job actually it requires a one parallelism or 10 parallelism. And then it keeps looking that. It fires a call to the job manager, and once it says the satisfied that I have the full resource, then it submits the job. We run as a single job in a job manager, right? So in our one, the container runs a single job with a job manager, and that's how we deploy across the cluster. This is some of the scale and performance we run. We run around 50 streaming. Most of our analytics run, so these are all end user facing analytics. We have around peak is 120K per second of the RPS of the streaming. We have 10 billion events per day, 2.5 terabyte per day data. In production, we run around 20 plus Mesos cluster. Now, now we are, we saw some of the issues with those resource scheduling, the one I mentioned. So we are, got some inputs from Jorg. Like he's suggested us to run marathon and marathon with some different approach to get those, you know, multi-talents in a better way. We use our homegrown solution for auto scaling with ASG. There's a Aditi behind she has written a tool called Xscale, we call it. We do some auto scaling with that. Plus we use ASG if we have to auto scale the Mesos cluster. And we have our own maintenance. So a lot of this Flink platform, like Flink job, the image metrics, we have our homegrown tool, we call it the Scopus, which takes the metrics to Elk and Prometheus, and that's how our downstream all alerting and management works. I'll give it to Jorg. Thank all you. All right. Thank you so much. So yeah, last time I was over, it was really interesting chatting with you. And originally, this was actually just, uh, I think I submitted that talk a while back. And then we were ch chatting like it sounded like the perfect talk to add you on top and your experience on top. All right, now let's come to the core part. What it actually like best practices for operating Flink on Mesos or some insights? Uh, first of all, and this is true for in general for any of those container systems, uh, you should make sure Flink has this nice UI and everything, but anything which goes into production should be uh, coming through some kind of endpoint and should be a version thing. So also if you're building, for example, Docker images, one thing I don't like about Docker images is that you can't actually overwrite tags. So uh, you should treat them actually as immutable because that'll make debugging a whole lot easier because you actually figure out this version has been running in production and otherwise it might be you had, you have like 200 machines or so, yeah. right? For many jobs, maybe half of the jobs are running in one version of the Docker image, the other half is running with another version of that Docker image, and that'll make debugging, metrics, and everything a whole lot harder if you can't figure out uh, which is which. Um, so what we also see is that if you're running on-prem, typically you have your own Docker registry or your artifact server. So Docker registry just interprets that as artifact uh, registry inside the cluster. Uh, and that'll also significantly reduce the amount of data you would need to pull in. Uh, HA setup. So uh, this is actually from the DCS uh, Flink package, the configuration. So if you want to run an HA, you should use HDFS. Uh, if you run that on Mesos slash DCS, it's actually rather simple. DCS package install HDFS, uh, list the endpoints, and then you actually get exactly what you need to throw in there. So uh, that's your HA setup, which helps you survive, uh, where then first of all, the checkpoints are stored, and secondly, it also helps you to survive uh, job manager failures. Containerization. If on any of those platforms, so this is actually true for uh, both the Kubernetes deployments and uh, also the Mesos deployments, we want to know how can we run Flink in one of those containers. And uh, the first thing, uh, if we are running on Mesos, uh, we should think about is like in which kind of container we want to run. I mean, at the end, there isn't like a single concept container. It's actually a combination of namespaces and C groups, Linux, low-level Linux features, and so 
Uh, with Mesos, you actually have a choice. And uh, what the package support and what we see a lot of people doing is just building it on the fly with something called UCR, so Universal Container Runtime. And with that, I don't have to build a Docker image as you would do in your CACD pipeline, but I can simply upload all of my artifacts, my jar file, uh, and here I have my JRE somewhere. And then when starting this container, he just pulls in all those images, uh, those artifacts, which are typically much smaller compared to a full-blown Docker image. The second thing we have to be aware of is that we're actually running a JVM inside a container. And the JVM, especially prior to uh, JDK 9 and 10, and just what I typically see in uh, enterprise is that 8 is still very popular. Uh, so with that, you should be really careful of how you put uh, the JVM inside a container, because it won't be aware of those C groups. Uh, so if you're running uh, JVM on, side, on top of a virtual machine, uh, the JVM, it will, it will look up down at the uh, OS level, and that will tell it you have that many CPUs, you have that much memory available. If the same thing happens in a containerized environment, e.g. Docker, uh, it will still look up down at the system, but that might tell it, hey, you have 32 cores available, you have uh, 20 gigs of RAM available, but your C group constraints that actually only give you your container environment only gives you one CPU and two gigabytes of RAM. And by default, the JVM will actually go in and set a lot of those defaults to whatever is available on the host. So in that case, it would set default number of garbage collection threads, default number of uh, threads in the fork joint pool to 20 because the underlying system has 20 CPUs available and your JVM will actually just been uh, trashing between different threads. So in that case, you should either upgrade to like JDK 9 or 10, which are becoming C group aware, so they help you avoid a lot of this. Not fully, but uh, mostly. It's a much better default. Um, or you should actually just override the defaults for those uh, number of threads or also the heap size, because if the default heap size is initialized to uh, 20 uh, gigabyte or 18 or so, and uh, you only have two available in your C groups environment, and then it will be killed. Uh, this can become quite unpleasant. So um, resource allocation. So this is a question like, how many resources should I assign to my job? How should I scale my job? I would say this is like an infinite hard problem. Uh, so the best thing I would recommend for production is actually just monitor that. So the two problems are if you give it too few resources, it will either run slow, too few CPU resources, or it will actually be killed if I'm having too few uh, memory resources because I'm going OM, or also slow because I uh, have to clean up a lot. Uh, so. If you're using too much, on the other hand, this means you're wasting resources in your cluster. So the best recommendation is to actually have a monitoring dashboard and look what is this percentage of uses, used uh, resources where, where it's allocated resources and thereby get a feeling for what your job actually needs because this heavenly depends on the job you're running. In memory, you should uh, consider some overhead uh, you're allocating over the heap space because the JVM is actually using quite some stuff around, especially a JNI um, uh, threads and so on. So this is not all living on the heap. So as, as like rule of thumb, I typically go for like 2x heap space. But again, this heavily depends on the job which is running inside the container. Flip 6 gives us more flexibility there. Uh, especially when it comes to like the parallelism, like how many task managers I want to run. So the nice thing here is uh, there was a talk this morning by Till, um, who was talking about it in more detail, but said I have some flexibility, not so much if it comes to those container limits, but if it comes to the overall number of tasks I'm running for a given job. When I'm running something like this in a multi-user environment, and this is what you also mentioned with Marathon on Marathon, what we've been talking about, I typically I want to share those cluster resources 
first of all, between the frameworks, but also between different users. And I want to have certain guarantees for different users who's allowed to use what. Because if one user is taking over this entire space here, this is not very nice because then no one else can run something there. So I want to have a way of controlling that. And the way this is typically done in Mesos is by using so-called quota. So uh, I would have one so-called resource role. So for example, group A, in which all the jobs from group A are running. And then I can say group A has a maximum of 200 CPUs, which then uh, by default is also the minimum uh, which are reserved for them. So group A can always be sure that they can access 200 CPUs in the cluster. And when someone else is starting jobs in the cluster, they can only take up that many resources that there are still 200 left for this group A. Um, the other way we often see that uh, being done, <laughs> partially also uh, initially there, is that you would take uh, specific machines. So you would actually take the first five machines and assign them to group A and so on. And that again ends up with those problems we saw early on with the static partitioning. This is operator heavy and it also doesn't give you flexibility, you're wasting resources. So this is why this quota is a very nice concept because it's not tied to particular agents, it's like a cluster-wide concept. In the cluster, I don't care on which node, I want to have 200 CPUs reserved. Changes and uh, updates. So how do I update from one Flink version to the other? How do I do configuration changes? Uh, as of right now, this involves uh, updates, but we are working there. So this entire Flink Mesos integration is a really great community project. So we're just having discussions of how we can utilize checkpoints and or parallel deployments to deal with that. Um, I threw in this picture here because in general, uh, updates, they're if I want to update while my job keeps on running, it's a rather complex problem, which inside Mesos we often uh, encode as state, state machines. So we want to transition from one state where, in this case it's, it's a deployment where I have nothing, to a state where I have uh, two CPUs and four gigs of MAM, and those are reserved for my job. And then there are certain state transitions to move from one to the other. So this is a typical uh, way in which we are also discussing to kind of implement a state machine for updating those services. We already have that for HDFS, Kafka, and uh, other services, but we don't have it currently for Flink. All right, I have uh, six minutes left, and I actually just wanted to show how that all turns out in practice. And with this Wi-Fi, I'm still hoping that the live demo will go well. So let's pray to the demo gods. Here, I'm actually having a DCUS cluster up and running, and I said DCUS is just a very nice way of uh, deploying Mesos here right now. So underneath, uh, we can even go there. Uh, we have Mesos running, and this just kind of, it, it gives me a lot around Mesos. So it's kind of like a Linux distribution where I have a kernel, uh, a few of us will actually run compiler kernel from scratch. Most of us will use something like Ubuntu. Then I already installed Flink. I didn't uh, care too much about uh, the uh, installing it, and I'll do it again here. I was mostly concerned that the Wi-Fi will fail on me when I try to upload the job. But let's just see how we would do that and install a second Flink framework. So here, this is the service catalog. As mentioned, this is like all those projects. And the Wi-Fi already is slow. No, let's continue here. Uh, so in this catalog, we have like all those uh, both commercial and open source projects. And in this case here, we have Flink. So I click here. And now I just need to change that name because I already installed Flink. So we're just going to call it Flink2. Uh, we have settings here, so we can change, uh, set the how big should an app master be, how big should my uh, tasks be, how many task managers, and so on, security. And here we can also uh, connect it to HDFS, as mentioned, for high availability. Okay. Success, it's deploying. So here we see that uh, this was 
that currently it's uh, deploying. So here the health check is still red, and it needs to spin up the entire cluster. So while that's happening, I'll briefly switch over to the first cluster. So here, this brings us to the well-known uh, Flink UI. As mentioned in production, I rarely use it, but it's kind of nice for demos. So what I also already done, this is kind of this critical part, which I uh, wasn't, didn't want to rely on the Wi-Fi here, is I uploaded a jar file. Um, so actually, uh, DCUS also comes with a CLI, so I can also look at that from the CLI. And if there's a CLI, this typically means we also have HTTP endpoints. So uh, most coding I see around is actually then using those HTTP endpoints for both uploading jars, for listing jars, as we do here, and uh, then also for starting jobs. So this is like a single click. Let's just do that here. Good. And I have a very simple, it's not a complex, it's just a window query uh, running here. Um, so, and uh, now let me just briefly go back here, as I have the part which takes a while out of the way, and explain you what the rest of the demo does. So the idea of this demo is to filter transaction to detect money laundering. So there's a generator which generates transactions, transferring money from account A to account B. This is written into a Kafka pipeline, which is then picked up by Flink, uh, which again writes it into a Kafka pipeline, and then we have a display. So let's just get the, uh, get the rest uh, onto the cluster, which means Kafka and those generator and uh, the display. So here I'm using the CLI, DCS package, install Kafka. Yes, and, and now we're deploying Kafka. And the Wi-Fi is still very great. Yes, great. And the next thing we need to do, we now have to deploy our microservices. So both the generator and uh, also the uh, display, they're simple Go programs. So I actually don't, didn't build a Docker container for those, but what I use to deploy them is simple this command. Like the curl is kind of hacky. Typically, I would use a fetch because Mesos actually has a mechanism to fetch it itself. I just found it very appealing that I can encode this entire container in like one command. So I was kind of torn which way I should do it. So all this does, it gets this binary and then runs this binary against a load balanced address. So by default, our framework is called Kafka. So I can reach actually a load balanced version of those. Uh, uh, brokers, the Kafka brokers, under this address. And this also makes it very simple. I don't have to worry about on which node that's running. Uh, I can simply deploy that. And I have one minute left. And it's actually the same with the display. Okay, great. Let's switch back to the cluster UI. And now we see here we both have our two Flink versions running. So this is the one we installed here. Uh, we could also go to the UI. Yes. So that has been freshly installed. And we have our generator here and we have Kafka here. So this might take now a while, but if we simply look at the log files, we hopefully see some something showing up here. In, in just a second. So it takes a while for the generator to throw in the data. But uh, while we are waiting, we have five seconds for questions. And then we hopefully see uh, some output coming here uh, to the display. Any questions from the audience? Oh, we, we, we'll still be around. We'll still be. 
And uh, so with that, then just a short shout out to all collaborators. This is a really great open source project. So we have Till from Data Artisans, we have Aaron in the back, uh, we have Robin and Misha working on that. So it's really like a quite large community. And also if you feel you want to contribute, it's all open source, contribute to Flink, contribute to Flink Mesos, contribute to DCS package, probably most important, contribute to documentation around that. And uh, do you want to s bring across your last okay. message? So mm -hmm. this branch we are hiring, we're mm -hmm. look, looking for some mm -hmm. data in front data platform engineer. You can go into branch careers. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Three questions. Um, so uh, in the um, mm -hmm. first one, are there any memory limits in the MISOs uh, when we are launching those containers? Uh, mem memory limits? Yeah, any limits, yeah. resource limits? Like, let's say for a Frink uh, task manager, if I want to allocate 64 gig memory, yes. can I do that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I briefly showed the configuration. All right. I said typically this uh, configuration is stored in a JSON file, and uh, you version that JSON file somewhere safely, and then you deploy with this version config file. Uh, a follow up question um, Is there a programmatic way for me to launch a Flink? Uh, cluster and then submit a job, like you're doing yeah. through a UI, can yeah. I do it programmatically? Yeah. Okay. So uh, I can do it here from the CLI. Typically I would just go against the endpoints. So there, there are oh, HTTP, there, there's a REST endpoint. Uh, easiest way is probably to look at the CLI, uh, how it's a simple yeah, Go program, okay. and the CLI shows you uh, how, how you're going against those REST endpoints. I mean, there's, there, um, there's uh, you need authorization to go against them, because uh, DCS is giving that to you, but that's also all encoded in, t in the CLI. One more question. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'll answer that question. Mm -hmm. So we do run, it's a like, we don't mm -hmm. submit by UI, it's a fully programmatic. Mm -hmm. we run. Uh, one question, why would I choose Mesos versus Yarn? I mean, I know Mesos, you said you can do lots other other frameworks, but any other reason why I would choose Mesos versus Yarn? Um, so, <laughs> Uh, this is this can get into long discussions like how they deal with resources, um, how they deal with the cluster. So uh, why I would uh, choose Mesos right now, the short answer is simply because of scale and reliability uh, and the number of frameworks I can run on top. I mean with Yarn, they're, I mean they also started these uh, containers on top of Yarn, but I never really saw that take off and uh, with Mesos, you, you have a choice of this Marisol, which is a container scheduler. You can run Kubernetes on top. So you just have like a large set of tools to run. Uh, if you're only running one Hadoop cluster, that's all you run. Use Yarn for that. But if you actually need to mul have multiple tenants, multiple distributed systems in your cluster, uh, he's looking at his watch, uh, use Mesos underneath. Hmm? Do we have any other questions before we wrap things up? Okay then, uh, please join me in thanking the guys for their talk. Very informative.